Our co-founders, Noe, Patrice, and Ellie Reza moved into this space um, in 2018. We like to say that Patrice's child really kind of manifested this space. Um, his caretaker at the time was aiming to open up a daycare here and with some permit struggles invited the co-founders to come in and take over the lease. Um, and they really sat in this space for two years, setting intentions, um, prayers, getting to know the neighbors, getting to really understand our neighborhood and, and local community, and then um, officially opened up this space uh, in late February 2020, just two weeks before the pandemic. Um, and then of course, once lockdown came, the, the space had to shutter and really uh, the co-founders used that time to really dig into their imagination, really think about how they wanted to utilize this space and, and be a, 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 a responsive art collective um, in that moment. Um, and so that's a lot of how the abolitionist pod was born. Um, during that time, uh, Crenshaw Dairy Mart was home to the Inglewood Community Fridge um, and really, really kind of planting the seeds of our abolitionist imagination. Um, and so a lot of what you'll notice in our space is that we really call on our ancestry within the Black Arts uh, movement and the Black Arts lineage here in Los Angeles, um, namely St. Elmo's Village and the idea that you know, everything around us is a canvas. Our space is full of art and, and most of it done by artists within our community um, and artists that we care deeply about and are in practice with. Um, what's behind me, this is the Blake the Great statue by St. Louis artist Damon Davis. I lovingly call him the protector of the Dairy Mart and, and of our space. Um, you'll see that we have floor murals here that are visible from the flight path. Um, we often get flights flying over us into LAX, and so folks on those flights can see our murals from the sky. Um, we have um, just a lot, of, a lot of artwork within our space. Uh, we have our art studios, uh, where we have five practicing artists that are here on any given day making work. And then we have our Crenshaw Dairy Mart Gallery, um, where we rotate th shows throughout the year. So what we're standing in right now is the Abolitionist Pod. This is the skeleton of our prototype that was uh, built in spring of 2021. Um, so this is the very original um, that we built in partnership with the We Rise initiative. Um, and this was installed at the Mocha Geffen. So, um, you'll see that the materials are made out of bamboo, and if you can envision it, at its peak it held these curtained walls that had about a thousand plants in them, um, and were really inviting for folks to come out and um, harvest from the plants. Um, some folks would swap plants, um, some folks would just come in, hang out, rest, take naps, um, and really, really just really breathe in and, and take in all that the pod carried and had to offer. It really was a portal for us. Um, now that we have it here at the Dairy Mart, this has really become our, our dreaming space, our imagination space. Um, during our fellowship, it became a classroom. This is where all the weekly lectures and workshops happened. Um, this is our collective somatics practice space, um, really just kind of like our anchor and our centering point. So we we use it um, for all of those purposes, and then we also use it as a study. Um, as we continue to build more pods, we're constantly referring back to this um, and really just paying attention to the pieces that we may want to shift and change as we continue to build. I'll also add that all of like the plants on the perimeter, some, some are thriving, some not so much, <laughs> but they are all the original plants um, that were installed in the pod in 2021 and then all of those that did not make it were um, were placed into our tech non-han compost and uh, have really birthed some beautiful harvests we had a lot of squash last fall um, and we're just really excited to just see see these plants live on this is a place of of care and a place of imagination, um, a place of rest, um, a place of creativity, um, and that all of those to us are just key tenets of abolition and the abolitionist imagination. Um, and we really believe that our, our pods are spaces where that type of, of energy is encouraged. This is particularly special to me because this project is how I came to this team. Um, I joined 
this team in March of 2021 when it was just uh, our three co-founders, um, Noe Olivas, Patrice Colors, and Ali Reza Duris. Um, and they asked me to come on to actually project manage the build of this pod. And to me, this is just like the start of the dream <laughs> and the start of the dream team and just everything that we have um, been able to work on together. Um, for me, it all starts here. So I just, I feel really grateful that this pod is in our space um, and a part of our everyday use and our everyday conversations. And um, it's really just a beautiful place to come and, and, you know, fellowship with folks. And, you know, I've had personal friends and family that come visit the Mart and this is where we hang out. And it just really, really just encourages that, that love. Like you can really feel all the magic <laughs> when, you're, when you're in this space. So this mural, Let's Get Free, this was actually uh, inspired by a performance piece that Patrice did called Fuck, Fuck White Supremacy, Let's Get Free. Um, and so this was done at the end of 2022 um, and Noe actually uh, stewarded his apprentice Chase through the process. So this was actually his first mural. Um, and yeah, we try to rotate them out maybe like once every two years. Prior to this mural, uh, it said Pray for LA, which was the initiative that we born, uh, that we birthed the uh, abolitionist pod under. Um, and then prior to that, it was actually Care Not Cages. So this is, um, this is something that was really exciting for us. And we do, we do try to keep them updated. Um, yeah, this one was done literally right before all the crazy rains at the beginning of 2023. So it is a little bit faded, but we love it. Share with us a little bit about this fridge, Inglewood Community Fridge, is it still active? Do folks still come? And it's not active right now. Um, it was actually only active during 2020, but this, I, I like to think that the fridge really called a lot of like future Crenshaw Dairy Mart program, programming into fruition. So the Inglewood Fridge was started by uh, local organizers, Juice Wood and Vern Yancey. And they like at the peak of COVID and at the peak of lockdown, they were looking for local businesses to host the fridge for them and were having a hard time finding places to say yes. And Juice happened to walk by one day and saw Noe and Ali Reza outside and, and asked them and it was a, a easy yes. Um, and so the Inglewood Community Fridge was actually parked right outside of the Dairy Mart um, for a few months and they had this really beautiful system of folks that were coming by to replenish it and, and really care for it. Um, one of them being Juice's mom, Miss Loretta, who's now our bookkeeper. <laughs> the artwork on the community fridge was done by another uh, local Inglewood artist, Oto. Oto was actually one of the first artists to really come into the space when the co-founders moved in here and really helped to incubate um, a lot of the vision for the Dairy Mart. And Oto also did our Saint Knit mural as well. Um, but when we launched our fellowship uh, about two years after that, um, Juice and Oto were two of our three fellows. Um, Juice is a really incredible multidisciplinary artist. They have an MFA in theater and like really have a beautiful way of incorporating um, mutual aid and community love into their practice. Um, Oto being also now multidisciplinary. When we first met him, he was a painter, but now he's a painter and a designer and a lot of graphic work. Um, and then the third fellow, Autumn Brion, she also was really integral in the early days of the Dairy Mart and was actually the co-curator of the first exhibition that opened here. Um, and so we really took uh, a lot of the, the, the thought around like building a creative economy and like really wanting to reinvest into artists and into folks that were pouring into us and into our space. So the Community Fridge really started a lot. Um, it, it informed a lot of the practice and ethos behind the abolitionist pod, it, it really brought together a lot of relationships. It helped us to meet folks within our community and just really, really means a lot to us. Mm -hmm. And in this way, the fridge, the pod, just the collective communal space, do you see it as like centering abolition and providing community with the understanding like this is the space where you can come and abolitionist practice all yeah. the time, whether it be wanting access to foods or wanting a space to sit? Uh, is that yeah. how community members kind of engage with it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it all really connects to just our, our ethos of care um, and connection. And I think, you know, even if the fridge isn't active at the, at the current moment, but a lot of the relationships from it still are, and that feels really important to us. And, you know, we really love when folks do come into the space and it's, 
you know, I, I always say that like time doesn't exist here. It's really easy to come in and either sit in the pod or sit, you know, on our church bench or sit at the front table and you're just here for hours. And it's, it's just, it feels very welcoming and it feels like a place where folks want to engage with each other and like, you know, flesh out dreams and really kind of see what's possible. So yeah, I, th I think it all really ties back into that community of care and that element of care that's that's tied into abolition. My name is Noe Olivas. I'm originally from uh, San Diego, California, uh, unceded territory of the Kumeyaay people. Um, I am an artist. Uh, I'm a co-founder of the Crenshaw Dairy Mart. I'm an educator. Um, I'm always uh, rotating hats, you know, just different, doing different things all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just being here at the Crenshaw Dairy Mart, uh, our three pillars are abolition, ancestry, and healing. And that's what the conversation has always been about ever since we, we, we got here at, at, at this place. Um, so just kind of like really thinking about those, those three pillars and how they have uh, informed my practice, but also um, how do I talk about it in a visual term. So art is the way that I kind of, that I do it. Um, and a lot of the work that, 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 that I'm working on is truly responding to what, what a world of abolition could look like. Um, particularly this work right here is talking about the border walls uh, in proximity to uh, Mexico. We're about, we're in Inglewood, so we're about like two hours away, two, two hours and a half from, uh, from the Mexico border, um, San Isidro or, um, um, yeah. But um, yeah, it's just kind of like talking about like uh, growing up in an immigrant home. What, what does that mean? All the different challenges, um, being close proximity to the border, crossing the border, the experiences of crossing the border with the with the border patrol, um, no, noticing like uh, the policing in a way, like the security, all the checkpoints. The title of the exhibition is called uh, Gilded Dreams. Uh, this is a title that I collaborated with the curator, Anna Briz. Um, we, were talk we were talking about um, how these, these borders are really just like these, these walls um, and what's it mean to, like, um, to dismantle them, but also what do these walls do? And what they end up doing is these walls are up there because of capitalism, because of imperialism, um, and it creates violence, it causes harm. Um, and, and she was researching about the Gilded Ages, that's towards like the, 18, the end of the 1800s where, you know, industrial revolution starts to happen, you know, the richer starts to really get rich and the poor gets poorer. And that's kind of, I, I think it's important to bring that up right now in these times um, because that's what's currently happening right now where you see there's war happening over in, in Gaza. Um, you know, just the way that imperial, imperialism works is it's, it's very violent, it's very harmful. These, these, these border systems are, are, are uh, systems of oppression. And, and the way that I'm thinking about it is like not necessarily, it's, 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 it's locally too, because like the, the fence behind me is such, such a, a common thing that we see here in Los Angeles. Um, but it's also, uh, fences that we see in prisons, it's uh, fences that we see at our borders, we also see them uh, globally as well, and it's just like this idea of uh, separation, and what's it mean to, to really uh, move with care, uh, and, and instead of putting money towards uh, war or the military, it's like how can we like start uh, creating uh, more organizations about care and, and really kind of like supporting, you know, humanity in a way. The, a lot of it is just coming out of my own experience. Um, just thinking about the border, crossing the border as a kid, uh, we would, uh, my family and I, we would travel a lot from San Diego to El Paso and down to Chihuahua. So just like witnessing of how, what, what's it mean to be crossing the border, but also like to be interrogated and um, I, it didn't always really sit well with me. Um, 
and also just like in those moments, those checkpoints of like answering questions and having to be prepared, but also seeing like the anxiety of my parents as well. Um, but also just when they came over, it was always a worry of my father not coming home, you know? Um, so I, I think for me, just kind of like talking about this immigration experience, it's not just my narrative, it's, it's so many people's narratives. Like all my, my friends or the people that I know have their uh, immigration story and their parents' immigration, how they crossed over and how, how much sacrifice has, has gone into that as, as far as like our family members. But it's also, um, you know, how imperialism works in those ways, like the strategies that they employ um, that, that, that really cause harm to our community. Um, and I, I, it's important for me to talk about that just because in the, in the context of, of ab abolition is really thinking about um, what happens if we look at, a, 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 if we move with care rather than um, violence, rather than punishment culture, um, and just h how do we do that, first of all? And, and I, obviously I think, um, you know, seeing like the fundings, like the more I'm learned about how how funds get distributed, even like, you know, tax season is kind of coming out, where are those tax money going to? It's not going to the things that we actually really want our world to, to be going towards, just like care, it's, it's going, it's funding war. And um, all of this, like, it's, it's just, I think part of the whole immigration thing is just like the scratching the surface of like, this is actually right here are next like right here close to us and but then like it, there's there's more to it there's the locally uh nationally and then there's also globally so it's like really trying to open up that conversation and using like the the language of of, of a chain link fence is like so so common and and being confronted by the chain link fence and the barbed wire like it it there's it kind of like pulls your body in a certain way but where I where 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 I do the intervention is like actually cutting out the 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 fence with the saguaro cactus and you know welcoming like okay like what happens if we open these 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 borders what happens if uh, how how are we gonna move what does that world look like um, but it's just kind of like opening up that that imagination that 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 portal of just a, a, another world that we can live in honestly I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, abolition, I, I think abolition is always within us in, in, in some form. It's just actually finding the language for it. I think, um, you know, just as, 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 as young, just like, you know, you, you know what it is, you know what it feel like to, to I, I think for me it's like, um, you, you know, how you you know that there's oppression, but you don't have the language to, to talk about it, or you don't know how to talk about it, or you don't know if someone else is thinking the same things that you, you're thinking about as a, as a kid, and you're also seeing certain things in the street, and that becomes kind of like normalized. But as as like you know, just learning and finding that language and and understanding what what abolition is, and um, you know, uh, going to school has helped me out a lot as well. Of you know, not necessarily like high school history, but the, this other history of like black history, uh, Chicano history, you know, um, other, other histories that are not taught usually in the, in the, in the high school um, curriculum. And you start to like, kind of like build all these things like, oh man, that, so that's what's actually happening. You know, so you start to open your eyes little by little. And, and, and start to develop that language. And I, and I started to, to, to develop that language uh, mostly uh, in, um, during my MFA at USC, um, where I, I met Patrice Colors. And uh, well, Patrice, you know, you know, she does, she, you know, she's a, 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 free, a freedom fighter. So just, just being with her and other people in the community and learning from them and, and you know, showing up. I think that's the, the other thing of abolition is like, how, how are you going to show up? And even just kind of like being there for the certain uh, protest or showing up here at the Crenshaw Dairy Mart, the work that we do is, 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 is a way that I, I, I practice uh, abolition at, at a daily. Um, and not just like here at work, but also within my relationships. Um, but 
that's kind of like the first time I'm like really like understanding what abolition is and how uh, how to you know put it into our culture in a way. I think being an abolitionist right now means to at this moment I think I'm like really like feeling it um, is to be tender. Um, there's something about that tenderness or trying to be soft, trying to just listen, just trying to be still um, and to, to, to find like uh, that compassion for, for myself and for others, um, to, to, to have that, that, that space. Um, and that, that tenderness really allows me to kind of like get into that space of like, okay, cool, like uh, this is happening, how are we gonna move or how can I just be there for, for that person or for, my, for myself too? You know, I think that's like self-care is really important. Um, but abolition, like I'm thinking about it in the sense of like, like really being tender. And by being tender is like the opposite of like really trying to understand and dismantle um, uh, patriarchy and, and that, that, that patriarchy culture. So it's like for me to be tender is a lot of work to, to get to that point, but there's also a lot of reward in that way um, to, to move with tenderness because uh, it, it, it really allows me to, to slow down and to be present for, for myself and for someone else. The work, I, for me, even though it's like very political, uh, a political statement that, that I'm saying, it's also uh, very spiritual in a way too. Uh, I, th I think a lot about spirituality in my work. Um, when we're opening up borders, um, you know, it's actually opening up portals, portals that our ancestors can come in and help us, um, opening up uh, our hearts to uh, each other. Um, uh, there's, there's a painting called, uh, um, let me just, let me remember the painting. <laughs> you might have to edit that out. Uh, uh, Keep your head to the sky, and it's that's uh, that, that's uh, a song by uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. And I think that song is is a very beautiful thing because I, I'm also thinking about like you know keeping your head up to the sky, thinking about like the greater spirit, whatever you may believe in, whether it's God or the higher being or uh, even the power that you have within yourself to, to make those type of changes. And I feel like that's what, you know, how spirituality works or how prayer works is like, it's coming to collectively and uh, doing, doing that work uh, to produce change. Yeah, I'm thinking about the work as a, as a, as a, a spiritual way as well. Um, just like acknowledging that, you know, that we're all connected in some way, that we have the ability to call our ancestors for support, that we have the ability in ourselves to, to create change. Um, and that's, you know, to create a, a, a world of care, a world of love, you know, we have, we have that ability to do all that stuff. So I feel like the, that tapping into the spirituality is, um, is, kind of like hoping that we all can awake and notice that, that, that that's in us. So this is uh, Gilded Dreams. Uh, that's the title of it. It's a uh, it's eight by eight, eight by nine uh, fence, uh, powder coated in gold. Um, it's uh, mimicking like the, the border wall in Mexico, um, but it's also um, mimicking uh, the chain link fences around here locally in Los Angeles. Uh, conversation, also in conversations to prisons and um, any type of uh, caging people, thinking about the detention centers uh, down by the border as well. Um, this is really talking about what would it look like if we just really open up the cages and just like cut out that figure. So you have the saguaro cactus here, which is mostly uh, grown next to the, to the um, to around that area near the desert but it's almost like very body-like, so you can almost feel like you, it's like a body that you can go through, um, but still it gives a little bit of uh, the sense of, uh, of risk in a way uh, with the sharp edges, um, but also is like thinking about that risk is worth it, you know, to cross to the other side and imagine what, what can, can go on further over there. Um, yeah, this is also kind of like uh, in 2000, I believe it was like 2016, I think we just got to fact check that, is um, 
Uh, 45 was also uh, prototyping walls in the San Ysidro border. So he had like, I think it was like three, four walls that were built. Um, so this is kind of like, in a way, my version, but it's very open because I want folks to, to actually be coming in and imagining a different way of how to go about immigration and really putting the fundings towards uh, care or some sort of like, um, you know, just just more care. Well, what is that? What does those type of facilities would look like? Um, but uh, and then around surrounding the 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 down on the floor is like discarded tires. They're made out of terracotta. Um, this is really kind of like tapping into like what we normally see uh, in the freeways, the waste, also in deserts. You always see like these tires just kind of like discarded. They're called blowout tires, um, but they're also a cast uh, from my um, family's truck. So these are a cast of an actual tire um, that uh, I, I made. And um, uh, um, so it's just kind of like the discard. So it's like really kind of thinking about the, the, the pollution, but pollution, I'm, I'm thinking more uh, like within like South Central, you also see a lot of like tires everywhere on the freeway. But then you, once you kind of like head to like the desert, you still see that, it's so common. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about like the, the car industry, the petroleum in industry, how that has changed. Uh, it, has a lot of, it has a lot of impact also in the infrastructure of Los Angeles and why the way it is uh, right now. Um, this painting right here, uh, Keep Your Head to the Sky, a uh, song by Earth, Wind and Fire. This is a, a snippet of um, a cartoon, Speedy Gonzales. Uh, I was uh, looking at a lot of cartoons during my grad school, particularly Speedy Gonzales, and I was taking snippets of the landscape. I was thinking about the clouds and just the landscapes, uh, but also the narrative of Speedy Gonzales, where uh, Speedy Gonzales is like this like hero for his fellow mouse, uh, stealing uh, cheese, crossing the border to steal cheese from Sylvester the cat, El Huero, and bringing it back to his people. Um, so I'm thinking about like that concept of how like uh, Speedy Gonzalez is um, a hero, but also it, it's kind of, it's a it's a racist cartoon. The way they talk, things like that. So it's just really kind of like how how to. Um, play around with the, all, the, all that language. Uh, and then this one, it's like, I'm just looking at the clouds and thinking about it more spiritually. And um, it's, it's, uh, paint, it's oil paint on burlap, uh, upholstered. Uh, so it's like really, I'm playing around with like the, the dimension of it. It almost feels like star-like, uh, universe-like, um, but also referencing like car culture, lowrider culture but also can be uh, referencing like uh, the back of a bed um, where we have like the, the material being uh, burlap and burlap is usually associated with labor. Usually burlap is used to collect uh, the, the brush when uh, gardeners are, are um, cutting uh, the plants and just kind of like putting it into one ball. That was my job when I was a kid, uh, working with my dad and my brother. Uh, so it's like really thinking about this idea of labor and leisure, how, um, how capitalism works and, you know, really takes up a lot of our time as far as labor and we don't get a chance to really um, find rest. And, and, and this is just conversations with, with uh, my elders. Um, but yeah, and then this back area. Going back to like the Speedy Gonzales, uh, these are actually uh, diehard boots. Uh, my father wore these boots, not, not these boots, but these types of boots uh, when he worked uh, um, as a gardener. Um, he gave these to me and I decided to make them into roller skates. So it's just kind of like labor, rolling, moving, um, but also playing around with the, um, the stereotype of the sleeping Mexican in the back. It's just, um, engraved in the back, almost like, uh, like, like Jordans, you know, like, I, 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 you know, growing up in the 90s, you know, watching the Chicago Bulls, like, you know, wearing Jordans and just like, okay, what is this tag? This is going to be this, the, the sleeping Mexican, but it's, it's, it's playing around with this figure. And instead of thinking about it as like a drunk or a lazy figure, I'm thinking about it as like a, a healer or a, uh, um, you know, finding that rest that is necessary because, uh, most of these kind of like figures um, 
are coming from during the, bre uh, the Bracetto program when you see a lot of Mexicans just kind of like waiting in line to, to find a job. Uh, and, and these are stories that I heard from, 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 my, um, from my tia, which my grandfather was part of the Bracetto program. So she would tell me that he would wait three to four, four days just to, to see if he got accepted into the program or to see if he got another chance to, to go to the United States and, 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 and work. Um, so it's like a lot of this like, you know, again, labor and leisure, I, I, I call it the poetics of, of labor. And these skates, I, I tend to use them in performances and this video that we did uh, in um, uh, uh, New Mexico, which is uh, uh, Navajo and um, Apache territory. Um, and the, the film is called, it's a, it's a short film, it's a short uh, performance called uh, Keep Your Head to the Sky, or no, no. The Great Spirit Will Come Again. And this is in response to uh, a fellow artist. Um, um, his name is James Luna, and he, he was a performer. And I, I did some research with my, with my uh, partner, Anna Briz, and uh, Star Montana, which she, she's the one that uh, Star Montana filmed it. And it's just a performance about ritual, about creating a healing circle, about knowing what, what's on this land now, who's actually occupying this land. So it's like a lot of spirituality into it, but also calling uh, uh, and having hope that the Great Spirit will come again. And thinking about the Great Spirit as like, we can think about it as God, but also finding the Great Spirit within us to, to make that push and that change in a way.